Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Everything Real Estate Investing Show with Sean Pan. Today, we have Sean O'Toole. Sean is the CEO of Property Radar, a prop tech company that compiles property data that helps real estate investors and professionals create lists to market to. In this episode, we'll talk about how he got started with his real estate investing journey, as well as how he created this prop tech company. We'll talk about the challenges of bootstrapping your own business and how he was able to create one of the most popular prop tech companies that helps thousands of investors create enormous profits. So if you're interested in learning how to create your own prop tech company or hearing about the challenges of creating your own business from the ground up, you have to listen to this episode. If you guys are new to this channel, be sure to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell notification to see more videos just like this one. And if you guys need a harmony loan, be sure to contact me. You can find my contact information in the description down below. So without further ado, let's hop on to the interview. All right, Sean, thank you so much for being on the show today. Go ahead and introduce yourself and let us know who you are and tell us what you do. Hi, I'm Sean O'Toole, founder and CEO of Property Radar. And uh, I guess we're a prop tech company that's helped uh, investors, realtors, mortgage companies and home service companies research real estate and find new customers. Yeah, Property Radar is probably one of the most popular investment tools that most investors use. So if you guys don't know what it is, definitely go check it out after you listen to this episode. But Sean, it is a pleasure to have you on the show today. Can you give us some background into your history? Like how did you get started with real estate investing? Well, how did I get started with real estate investing? Well, jumping to that point, I had moved to my vacation house after the dot-com crash. You know, I was in Silicon Valley. I was part of three startups in Silicon Valley through the 90s. And, you know, but was kind of a startup guy. And so when the dot-com crash happened, like money got sucked out of startups and it was possible. It was just hard. And I took a little time off to regroup, kind of think about what I wanted to do next. The previous three had been other people's companies. And I was just, you know, sometimes the first employee or one of the first few employees and was really kind of ready to do my own. And but it was a tough time to, to do a startup. I'd always done venture capital-based startups and there wasn't a lot of venture money around and the rest. And a good friend of mine that I was spending a lot of time with was a real estate developer. And he introduced me to a friend of his that was flipping foreclosures, kind of suggested I should go write software for him. And I had no interest in just writing software for the you know 40 or so foreclosure flippers at that time, but uh, went and met him anyways. So then after you met him, that's when you got introduced to the world of flipping houses. So you actually became a real estate investor yourself. Yeah. So we met and, and talked and, you know, again, I like, as we spoke, I was super interested. He was, did a lot of foreclosures and, you know, I think every one of us is at some point been arrested in foreclosures and flipping foreclosures. You know, I think that's like a universal truth. Everybody's been curious of what kind of deals you get and et cetera. And so, you know, we spent uh, lunch together and maybe another hour or so after that. And I kept asking him, you know, coming from that venture capital background, et cetera, is like, what's your return on investment, you know? And, you know, things like IRR, you know, like if you've got a certain amount of capital, are you able to keep that capital invested all the time? Or is it sitting in the bank, not earning anything, you know, to be ready? And how does that affect your returns? And, you know, he really didn't know. He had a you know, he said, look, I've got a nice life. It's a great business. But, you know, he didn't have, you know, wasn't doing that analysis. And so he kind of said, hey, you know, here's my last X deals, you know, feel free to take them and go through them. And I'd love to, I'd love to hear and love to see the uh, analysis. I still wasn't working, still wasn't doing anything. So I took him home and built a, a large spreadsheet with all the details from every single deal and all the related costs and, you know, profits and everything else. And then I knew how much capital he had total. And so then I was able to look and see how much of that capital was invested at any given time over a year. And guess what his total return on capital was? No clue. 80%. Wow. Annually. So, you know, 80% return on capital definitely got my attention, right? Like, I was like, oh, wow, this is much different than I expected. And, you know, I had a couple of exits in my time in Silicon Valley. So I had some cash and, you know, I looked at going back to work in Silicon Valley versus an 80% return on capital and said, well, this is kind of interesting, right? Like, unless I hit not just a good startup, but like a really good startup, right? I'm not likely 
to make as much money in Silicon Valley as I am flipping houses with the capital that I have. And so I said, you know what, I, I'm, I'm going to give this a try. And, uh, and I started flipping houses. So how long did you flip houses for? So five years total in the kind of uh, 2001 to 2005 time period, maybe four and a half. And I flipped uh, 155 properties in that time and have flipped, you know, a handful since then as well. That's crazy. And were you doing like direct marketing back then or just chasing foreclosures? Most, you know, I'd say 90% of my deals were on the courthouse steps, but I did a little bit of dabbling with everything else. I did direct mail, went to bankruptcy auctions, IRS auctions, you know, a little bit of door knocking that wasn't really a good fit for me. Not that it's not a good business. It can be. It just wasn't a good fit for my personality. And, you know, so yeah, I, I kind of tried my hands in lots of different things, but, you know, foreclosure auctions were the best personal fit for me. Very analytical, very process oriented, you know, less about those sales skills of, you know, talking somebody into selling your house, them your house. So, right. Um, but had a little bit of success with each, specifically the direct mail, you know, worked really well. And I always laugh though that, you know, people will, will use our app and, you know, download 200 addresses and send a piece of one piece of mail and go, I didn't get a single call. Right? And I found that I'd get one, you know, one real good shot at a deal for every 10,000 pieces of mail I sent. And usually would end up buying something with maybe a hundred K of profit in it. So you know, to make a five or $10,000 investment in direct mail in order to get a $100,000 return is totally worthwhile, but that's rarely the mindset people go into it with. Yeah, because you need to have the guts to shell out that 10,000 and, you know, thinking that, you know, you will make it back in the back end, but the initial investment is kind of hard to, to stomach. Well, and you can make that investment and not be very good on the phone and not very good at making a deal and not very, you know, that there's other things that can go wrong there besides that investment. So it's not usually where I advise people to start, right? I mm. actually, if you really want to get started and you want to go down that path or to direct mail, I always say start with door knocking, right? Find your list, right? And it could be a list of 10,000, right? And you're not going to knock on 10,000 doors, but start by door knocking on, against that list right? Because you'll learn something about the folks and learning face to face, door knocking is hard right now in COVID, I will say though, but you'll learn a lot more face to face and in person, right? Than you will on the phone and certainly than you will trying to make the case in direct mail, right? And then after you start to get an understanding of who's on that list, who your target audience is, then move to phone, right? And get to the point where you can close a deal on the phone, and if you can do that, then you start to really understand who that customer is, right? Even though you're trying to buy their house, I still call them a customer because you need to understand their mindset. You need to understand what it is they're looking for. You need to solve their problem. And that's hard to do starting with a postcard. Do you think some of these methods have changed in terms of their efficiency since the time you were investing and now? Oh yeah, you know, for sure. Like the, the biggest thing, that I think has changed, you know, and this is going back even further, right? Like there's a great book called the direct mail handbook, right? Which talked about the need to have three impressions, right? Uh, you needed to send at least three postcards before you should expect a response. And I still think that's on postcards. That's still a good rule, right? But now I forget the number, but, but like we're exposed to thousands of advertising impressions every day, right? And, you know, they say now that probably the average number of impressions Aaron's doing on our team is doing a podcast with a gal from IBM who studied this. And, and I haven't gotten, uh, I haven't listened to that yet. So, but she did research and it's something like 27 impressions now, right? You know, I don't think it makes sense to send somebody 27 postcards, right? So how do you get to 27 impressions? And, and I really think what's different now is multi-channel marketing, right? So roll back 20, 30 years ago, and you're not buying TV ads, right? And direct mail, sending that three times, you're gonna make a standout impression. Today, you probably need to do some online advertising, maybe send them an email, maybe send them a text, and send them still the direct mail. 
direct mail makes a great impression. A lot of people go, oh, people just throw that away. I guarantee you the time it takes them to get it out of their mailbox, look at it, decide if it's important or not, and then deposit it in the trash can is going to leave more of an impression than any online ad you'll ever place. Yeah, that makes sense. I was wondering, why do you think real estate investments have such a large margin of profit compared to other investments? Well, you know, I think the simplest answer, right, is I did spend a little, I've been mostly a software guy my entire life, but I did spend a couple of years in, in sales, actually selling computers at Radio Shack. And that was an interesting place to learn sales because, okay, I was mostly there to sell computers, which were a pretty high dollar item, right? And I got a pretty nice spiff uh, commission on each one of those computers I sold. But, you know, there were times I had to also help sell the resistors or, you know, these other things that were battery, right, for somebody's, uh, you know, calculator or whatever. And what you quickly realize is there's just a lot more room in a computer, like to make money, than there is in a resistor. You got to sell a lot of resistors to make a buck. You don't have to sell that many computers. You have to sell even fewer cars and even fewer houses, right? And even fewer commercial deals, right? The good commercial guys might do one or two deals a year. You'd starve if you did that, large deals. You'd starve if you did that as a residential realtor, right? And so, you know, I think the number one factor why real estate investing can be profitable is just the size of the deal. The size of the deal, there's more room there. That makes sense. And also I found that when you're dealing with, you know, individual home sellers, they may not be as uh, you know, knowledgeable about the market or taking advantage of how they can make their house as nice as possible to sell it for the highest price. You know, sometimes they're in a distress situation and they want to sell it for a discount. So there's more room there. Yeah. You know, I've, uh, I've encountered a number of those situations and, you know, I hope nobody listening. I've never believed in taking advantage of people's lack of market knowledge to like buy their house for less than it's worth. I know there's some people out there that do, that's never been my personal approach, but I've certainly ran into situations where, you know, people understand their house is worth more, but there's issues. Like I had a gal whose husband passed away, his kids from a previous wife or junkies and felt like they could come and go from the house at will and, you know, she tried to get restraining orders and other stuff and it just didn't stop. But he was also a hoarder. And so they had this three acre property and it was just full of junk. And so every time she talked to a realtor, they'd say, well, you would be happy to list it. But you've got to get all this cleaned up first. And she just said, you don't understand. I need to leave today. Like if you'll write me a check today, <laughs> you know, uh, you can have the keys and everything else and I, I need to leave today. And so it's who's ever giving me the biggest check today is the one I'm taking. And, you know, I gave her a, the biggest check, but there was a lot of profit in that deal. Nice. Yeah. Uh, and before you were saying that you like foreclosures a lot because it was very like to your style, very analytical. I haven't seen too many foreclosures recently. Have you seen, you know, foreclosures becoming a viable strategy anymore? Well, yeah, the the volume right now with the forbearances and stuff, right? Very hard, almost impossible to make a living. So we do see third parties buy properties every day, you know, so it is, there are still properties going to foreclosure, you know, but if you look across five states and there's 10 to 20 being bought by third parties a day, right? That's 300 a month. That doesn't feed a lot of folks and that's spread across, you know, almost a hundred counties. So yeah, no, it's, it's really tough right at the moment with uh, the foreclosure moratoriums, eviction moratoriums. So even if you get by the property, how do you get the folks out? Very challenging right at this particular moment due to COVID. But what that means is that all the foreclosures that would normally happen here are getting stacked up. And as those moratoriums come off, right, we're going to have a nice little wave of foreclosures. But yeah, right at this particular moment, you'd want to have another strategy as well. I don't see us ever going back to 2009, 2010, where you could be a newbie foreclosure investor and go buy, you know, a brand new house and have a 10% return on market or 10% return on rents, right? Like, you know, that won't happen again. 
uh, ever. So it was a very special time. Anybody who going into the foreclosure market with that kind of expectation is going to be very disappointed. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me your inspiration for creating foreclosure radar? Like you were doing really well as a real estate investor for five years. Why change into prop tech? So at the end of 2005, uh, I saw some things going in the market that made me not want to own any real estate. So I stopped buying and I sold everything except for my personal house. Couldn't talk my wife into that. You know, in the end, it worked out okay. But, you know, right, all these things are cyclical, but would have been nice to have sold before. But in any case, I got completely out of the market just because I saw enough things in the market that gave me concern that I didn't want to own property and didn't want to be buying more property. So was, I guess I was basically forced out of investing at the end of 05 by the, the market. Now, that was probably a little early, although I was investing in places like Stockton. So it wasn't that early. In fact, I did take a loss on the last property I sold in Stockton, which I didn't get rid of until almost, I think, May or June of 2006. Mm -hmm. And so can you tell me like what were the steps to creating foreclosure radar and like why you decide on this particular product? Yeah. So, you know, my big picture vision at the time, so having left tech and being a tech guy, right. And being, you know, having a pretty good knowledge of data, data science and systems and, and all the rest, it was really apparent to me that, you know, through my years of investing that there was a lack of good data, a lack of good software, right? Uh, the stuff that was out there was just terrible. And so I ended up building my own systems for myself to use starting in like 2002. And by the time I decided to get out, I was already tracking every foreclosure in California. So I had that data set and I had relationships with other data vendors and had you know, good relationships with trustees and auctioneers, et cetera, to go get the data and saw value in that. And also started to see foreclosures just rising exponentially and believe there was an opportunity there. I also had this bigger picture vision of creating uh, like a Bloomberg terminal for real estate doing for real estate what Michael Bloomberg did for stocks, bonds, commodities, and most of the other markets where, you know, you got near real time access to information about what was going on in those markets. I was a little naive, I think at that point about just how hard that would be and still is, but I certainly had no question the best foreclosure data of any of my competitors, peers, anybody in the market and felt there was value in that. So launched foreclosure radar. So what were some of those challenges that you were saying that couldn't make you this you know, Bloomberg terminal for real estate? You know, the, the, the core problem is actually with the county recorders themselves, right? So you, you basically have the two core data sets for real estate are one, the county assessor's office. And that's where we get who the owner is, bedrooms, bathrooms, square footage, what property type it is, those, those kinds of, of things, which we call characteristics, right? Ownership and characteristics. Sometimes uh, in the industry, it's called tax data, even though it has nothing to do necessarily like delinquent tax, a lot of investors think. So there's that core data set. And that is actually digitized data, right? You can just take that data and you can load it. There's a lot of challenges around that though, in that, you know, take something like use codes, right? Is it a single family or is it an apartment? Those use codes vary by county in every county and the quality of data varies by county in every county. And sometimes you'll find things like we see this a lot with apartments where, you know, maybe they just called apartments residential and you can't tell the difference between them and single family up until 1982. And then after that, they split them out. And so people are going, hey, you're missing all these apartments. Well, we're not missing the apartments. They're just not differentiated prior to 1982 because of the data at the county. So, but at least that data is digital and you know, data normalization, those kinds of things are fairly easy data science problems, right? There's still issues there but I think it's important for anybody to understand who wants to use public records to invest in real estate, which anybody investing in real estate should, but those are easy to understand. And then, and there's 3,142 roughly in the, in the US. 
And then you have the recorder's office, which is different than the assessor's office. So the assessor's office is where we get that data. The recorder's office is where the transactional documents get recorded. So, you know, I sell my house to you, a deed gets recorded, right? You get a mortgage from Joe, a deed of trust gets recorded, right? You don't make your payments, a foreclosure gets recorded, right? All these documents get recorded at the county recorder's office. And what most people don't realize is that only five bits of data get abstracted out of those documents, right? The date and the doc number, right? Which the, the county adds to it. The grantor and the grantee. So the grantor would be the seller. The grantee would be the buyer. The grantor would be the borrower. The grantee would be the lender on a loan. And usually the amount, right? You just, oh, sorry, the document type, not usually the amount, the document type. So those are the only five things you're kind of guaranteed to get. After that, you've got to go abstract the data off the document. And lots of people have tried using OCR and machine learning, et cetera, to do that, not with very much success. So most of that is still hand abstracted in the Philippines or India. And that is the part that adds just a lot of time and complexity. And then you get problems at the recorders themselves, right? In order to do that abstracting, you've got to be able to get an image of that document or a copy of that document from the recorder's office. And A, they don't have to provide it for free. So you got to pay for it, right? And then B, you've got to get it shipped off for somebody to look at. Then you've got to get it abstracted, get it back in. That part is incredibly time consuming and incredibly expensive, right? There's not a company in the United States that does that for every county themselves. Instead, you have all these regional players and then, you know, it's this big kind of incestuous industry where everybody buys from everybody and sells to everybody. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, even on my own time, I've been trying to do some of that kind of work and you're right. Every county, every city has their own different you know, zoning, you know, zoning types. And then you have to get the documentation. It's like a PDF. So then you can have to just like copy and scan it. You can't just control C, control V, right? It's a yeah. very time consuming indeed. Yeah. yeah. And that's, and that's the value we provide, right? Everybody says, well, public records is free. Why should I pay you 80 bucks? And I'm like, if you value your time at all, you'll realize that $80 is a, a month is less than the, you know, your time spent just going to the county and coming back, let alone getting the data. And then you got to get the tax data and this data, then you got to match it up. And then we bring in all sorts of other data like phones and email addresses and person demographics and all these other sources and the GIS data from the GIS departments, another county department, you know, that shows you the, the parcel boundaries and tells you where that property is located. So to go get all those data sets for one county and put it together is, hundreds and hundreds of hours. Exactly. And what were you doing to get those initial subscribers when you first launched your product? Yeah. So, you know, this was uh, 2007, May of 2007. One of the things that we did is a few months before we actually launched, we started the California foreclosure report. And the first one we did was in March. And I may get the headline wrong, but it was basically like, a billion dollars worth of properties foreclosed. And nobody was really tracking this and paying attention. And one of the things that we did that was very different was we actually tracked what was happening on the auction steps, whereas a realty track and foreclosure.com would wait, would have to wait, you know, six, eight weeks after the fact before they got the data because they have to wait for that deed to be recorded and the rest. So we were seeing what was happening, you know, months before all of our competitors. And so we launched this report and, you know, we were in the news literally every day from then through 2011, starting off with like local newspapers and, and smaller folks. But ultimately, you know, I, I even appeared on 60 Minutes, which is obviously has the largest viewership of any, or certainly at that time, at least had the largest viewership of any news program. So by providing this content, you became, I guess, famous for this topic. And then now people start looking for you for more information, right? Yeah. So lots of speaking engagements, you know, in the, uh, in the marketing world, they talk about paid, earned, social, organic, right? And so this is earned media, right? And uh, we definitely owned earned media on the uh, 
foreclosure front. And, you know, we're in front of tens of thousands or millions of people every day that just kind of provided a constant feed of new of folks. And what was surprising to us is like, we originally only saw two clients, right? Real estate investors and realtors was, was really the only place uh, that we focused. But I had school CFOs signing up to try to determine how many of their families were getting foreclosed on so they could see the potential impact next year on enrollment and what that might do to budgets, you know, and how that might affect how many, you know, teachers they needed to hire or let go. We had municipal bond traders using us to try to figure out what delinquency rates might be on, you know, municipal bond payments and just hundreds of other use cases that just still boggle my mind. And then, you know, and then the folk, you know, fighting against foreclosure and fighting for, for I mean, just everybody. So it, we really, and, and we got involved with uh, the state legislature and rewriting a lot of the foreclosure rules. And so we, we were right in the mix. That's crazy. There, there are so many ways to use data. It's, it's, it's amazing. And how was your team during this time? Like, was it just you for the longest time? Oh, no. You know, one of the reasons Foreclosure Radar started, too, was, you know, my first gut reaction when I said I don't want to invest anymore was just to go back to tech, not even do a startup. And But I was already collecting all this data, and I actually offered to sell this data that we were collecting to RealtyTrack and Foreclosure.com, and Brad at Foreclosure.com said, yeah, I'll buy it. And, and basically my only goal there was to keep my team of folks that were collecting it and aggregating it, you know, I didn't want to lay them off. And so I, I wasn't even looking at it as a profit center or anything. And then he, he, like, we had a contract, we were really close to signing it. And the best thing that ever happened to me was him calling back and saying, we can do this ourselves. We don't need you. Right. We're not, I'm not going to pay you for this. And um, I said, okay, go ahead. And he's like, we're, we're putting in a major project. We're going we're gonna to do this ourselves. And of course, they've never, ever launched that feature. It's really, really hard. So I said, screw it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this myself. Awesome. So from the very beginning, I guess you had a team. Like, were you yeah. the main coder or did you hire that out as well? Yeah, I did a lot of the initial development. I did most of the original UI work in Adobe uh, Flex. And mostly what I did was do the kind of layouts and hook up the front end. And then I had a developer that did most of the back end and then also kind of hooked the front end up to the back end. And then not too long after that, I brought on, I, I did some of the initial loading of, of data, but it was pretty clear that, that was there was a lot of work there. And so brought on a second engineer, Rob, there. And that was kind of it for a little while, the three of us on the development team. And then my assistant kind of ran the research side. She's still with me today. And, and then we added more and more as the foreclosure volume kept going up, we kept adding more people. And then we started expanding into new states and adding more people and then added more engineers. What were some of the growing pains that you encountered as your business started to grow? Oh, I think we encountered all of them, right? So until the 60 Minutes episode, I was writing a check every month, right? So even with the earned media, it's expensive to start a business. You know, I think I wrote checks, you know, and this is where I was fortunate to have done well flipping and, and fortunate to have done well in the Bay Area. But, you know, I wrote checks probably on average of 50K a month for almost two years. Wow. Um, year and a half, two years. And then 60 Minutes was our big break, right? Like if we hadn't gotten on 60 Minutes, it would have been much, much tougher go. But that, that really flipped us over to faster growth and got us over the kind of break even point of, of being able to build, you know, the team out of something other than just my pocket. So you have not received startup capital. I guess you guys did it bootstrapped. Uh, yeah, I just self-funded. I was part of three venture capital backed companies in Silicon Valley. And it really forces a lot of really poor decision-making. Venture capital works for a very select few companies. And they kind of know that. Their whole business model is kind of predicated or built around that, right? That only one out of 10 investments going to really pay off. The other two, maybe they just sell off. But they really care nothing at all about building good long-term businesses, right? They care about finding exponential growth, 
and you know that provides huge returns, big enough returns to pay for the all the losses. I think there's a need for other forms of capital to help, you know, long term, more stable, stables maybe they're just not this ultra high growth. Everything being ultra high growth focused, I think is a is a problem. Not that there's you know, not that we shouldn't fund those and not that those shouldn't happen. You know, that's, that's awesome. But if for some reason you're not fitting that, their primary goal is to get you off of their uh, roster, not reinvest or figure out how to fix it or, or, or anything else. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so when did you decide to pivot from foreclosure radar into property radar? So I actually decided, I think in 2010, we had a number of folks interested in buying us. Some just wanted to use their stock. And having lived through the dot-com crisis where I saw, you know, I thought I might have a $50 million exit in my last company there, you know, or something very large, like maybe retire for life kind of money. It went to zero, right? We were filing our S1 to go public in March, 2000. So I really had no interest in an all stock uh, deal. And so turned down some that in hindsight would have been very, very large. And after that, you know, kind of decided no on that. I said, well, you know, what's the future here? We had been growing into new states, but I really saw in 2010, even though I don't think our foreclosure business peaked until 2013, I really saw that it was going to peak and come back down and come back down significantly. You know, there's just enough regulatory change and other things that I, I didn't see just being in the foreclosure business would really be a sustainable, strong, strong business. And so I kind of came back to my original idea of the Bloomberg terminal, right? Let's, even though this abstracting, et cetera thing, like to really change all that probably isn't going to happen. I, I just felt there was the ability to build a better property information service. And that's really what we launched in 2012, started on it in 2010, launched property radar in 2012. And honestly, really kind of missed the mark with that first product. Not that it wasn't good, but with foreclosure radar, you know, Steve Croft said on 60 Minutes, if you want the best data or best view of foreclosures, I forget exactly the words, go to Sean O'Toole's website, Foreclosure Radar, right? Like that's a very simple value proposition, right? That's why school CFOs showed up. They wanted the best foreclosure data. Steve Croft told them to go there. Okay, right, done. When we transfer, transitioned into property information, I couldn't get Steve Croft to say, if you want the world's best property data, <laughs> go here. And... People are like, well, can't I get that from Zillow for free? And you're like, well, yeah, they have beds and baths and they have a little bit of information, but we've got a lot more information like ownership and, you know, mortgage details and who the lender is, how often they refinance, like all these other things that you can't find or search for on, on Zillow. And then people are like, okay, that's interesting. Why do I need it? Right. And, you know, every property information company to that date has had a sales team and typically had pricing in more like, you know, for your average use case, more in the thousand or $2,000 a month range, right? And they kind of nickel and dime you where everything, every bit of data you want, you pay for per record. And we had this kind of flat fee model where you pay a flat fee per month and you can look as many records as you want, which we still have, which is still fairly rare. So, you know, but our pricing didn't support a sales team. And so, you know, we did fine. The business was profitable, but it wasn't that kind of high growth SaaS, you know, business that you want. And it took me a while to figure that out, kind of move on from that. And, you know, this finally figure like, feel like we've kind of twisted that Rubik's cube, found that, that thing. And, you know, it's kind of sad to say, but it's, uh, Oh, who was it that said uh, for the millennial kind of generation, all the best minds of the millennial generation are, have been spent on how to sell each other crap, right? Marketing. Right. How to click buttons and whatnot. Yeah. And, and of course, that's where we kind of found our home, right? So anybody who wants to reach homeowners, property owners, right? Cost effectively, we have over 200 criteria that you can use to focus on that right group. And then you can market to them, whether it's via direct mail or online ads or email or text message or phone or door knocking or whatever, right? You can do that using our platform. And that's really where we found our, 
our sweet spot. And it's great for real estate investors who want to reach property owners and see if they want to sell. It's great for realtors looking for listings, but it's also great for solar companies who, you know, want to sell solar and roofing companies and window companies and, Shoot, we have coffee shops that use us to send postcards when people new move into the neighborhoods. It's a come and get a free Danish from us rather than going to the coffee shop down the street, right? Like, so we definitely kind of found our, kind of finally found our uh, niche there. But just, you know, it's fairly recently and we've worked hard to, to make the product a lot easier to use and a lot more accessible to folks who aren't maybe as steeped in real estate as our original real estate, real estate investor customers. So what was the actual tweak that you guys made to your product? Well, just a lot of things to kind of simplify the, the user experience and also to modernize it, right? Like the, the interface we used to have, uh, I designed in 2010, right? The web's moved on. We're still in a little bit older framework um, versus like React or some of the newer JavaScript frameworks, you know, so there were some limitations on what we could do, but we, we modernized it uh, quite a bit and we'll continue to do that. So simplified, modernized, we used to have, one of the things that was really confusing for folks was we had property search, foreclosure search, transfer search, right? And people didn't understand, well, why would I use property search if I'm looking for people in foreclosure or should I use foreclosure search? Which should I use and why would I use transfer search? And for somebody doing research, right, it was very, it's very powerful in that if you think through how many properties were in foreclosure in 2010 is a different number than how many foreclosures there were in 2010, which a different number than how many foreclosure notices, right, were filed in 2010. Those are all three different numbers, right? So you know, our foreclosure search actually searched the notices, right? Not the properties um, because a, a property could have more than one notice. Whereas our property search searched the properties and you'd only get one property even if it had two notices on it. So it was a great setup for research, but for your average person coming in trying to do a marketing list, that was super confusing. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, uh, I've only recently started using Property Radar, even though I've heard of your company for many years now. And yeah, I can definitely say it's, it's very, very nice to use. Like uh, I was using my own, I was doing my own data research using the tile records. And yeah. so going from tile records to your platform, it is 10 times, 100 times better for sure. And, <laughs> you know, I was definitely in that camp of, oh, why would I need to use Property Radar? I have this for free. Well, <laughs> it's worth it to use a different interface that simplifies all your data research for sure. Yeah, you know, I think... I think really, you know, what we do is we make public records usable and probably more important, actionable, right? So go get public records data from even from the title companies. We'll have a lot of this data you can get for free or you can go down and get it from the recorder's office, right? The recorder's office, just extracting it, right, is, is painful and expensive, right? So right there, it's worth it just to have it extracted, right? But from the title companies, a lot of them will give you, you know, reports based on pretty simple criteria that makes it free, but still it's this big spreadsheet, doesn't make it visual, doesn't make it actionable. You can't, you know, connect it to Zapier to automatically send a postcard when something new matches your list, right? You got to go back to, you know, in the minute you get that list from them, it's out of date. You got to go back tomorrow and ask for another list if you want the new stuff. They're not going to do that for you every single day, right? So, you know, that's really what we focused on is, is yeah, the underlying data is free, right? For sure. But compiling it, making it understandable, connecting it and showing the interrelationships with it and then connecting it out to these other systems and things is the value that we add and what we charge for. Right. And definitely the whole getting new data and then showing the difference between the old set and the new set is very important because when you get a list of 5,000 and one or two homes sold, it's very hard to see the difference between the two. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I was also wondering what's next for property radar. Well, so we're very close to launching nationally. So that, that one's big and, and that's definitely the, the primary focus right now. We just redid how teams work. So 
we're moving into slightly larger companies and, you know, kind of like what's happened with real estate agents, right? Real estate agents, you know, 10 years ago were, were largely all individuals. And, and now pretty much anybody doing any volume of transactions on the agent side is part of a team, right? That team uh, is working together to make that happen. And I expect we'll see more of that on the real estate investment side. A lot of my deals were done with the team too, where I was really good at title. Another guy was really good at rehab. You know, another guy was really good at talking to folks, you know, cash for keys, buying deals directly. And so together we were much stronger than any of us individually. And we did a lot more deals than if we'd each done our own deals and com- and looked at those together, we did more together as a team. And so we've really put a lot of focus into that recently and building out some of that team functionality and changing how that team functionality is built to be more like Slack and every other tool you use out there where we had this really kind of weird way we did it before. So teams getting national, those right now are our two biggest focuses. I got a bunch of really cool stuff in the hopper beyond that that I'm not ready to talk about. Awesome. Yeah, I'm really excited for our nationwide coverage. And to be honest, when I started using Property Radar, I was surprised that we only had five states uh, at the time. What was the reason to um, that limitation and how come we're able to suddenly boom, like have 45 new states in the system? Well, yeah, the, that boom has been two years of blood, sweat and tears and uh, me going from five engineers to 20 engineers. Wow. So it, it's hardly a boom on our side, um, but it will feel like a boom on your side. <laughs> Yeah. So why, you know, I, I kind of touched on some of it, right? So we launched foreclosure radar just in California because I already had the data. I started kind of marching out nationally, adding one state at a time. We got to five states and then saw this, you know, saw the regulatory changes were happening and said, I don't want to continue investing this much just in foreclosures, right? I want to go back and work on the product and get the product right. And, you know, in 2012, 13, when we launched Property Radar, it's a great product, got really good reviews and the people that got into it and understood it, loved it, but it was tough on the marketing and sales side. And I didn't want to put in large, in place a large sales staff. I also, at that time, I lost my kind of 2013 through 2016. I lost my dad, my brother-in-law, my sister adopted my niece. And so it's probably fair to say I was sidetracked. We still did a lot of development, brought out a lot of new features, but really hadn't found traction. Then more, you know, 2017, I really got back involved in the, in the company day to day and then kind of found this new fit on the marketing side. We still do foreclosures. We still do property. In fact, we're going to, I do think there will be enough foreclosures coming out of the pandemic that we're, we're making a pretty sizable reinvestment in that here. Over the next year, our customers that do foreclosures will start hearing from us shortly to get some of their feedback and input and what they'd like to see. We've got a bunch of ideas. So we will be making an investment, you know, in that space. And we have over the years too, we've invested a lot in keeping up. It's still one of my largest uh, staff items is tracking foreclosures. It's just really hard, even with how few there are now, you know, trying to keep up with it. We're having a lot of places right now where the, all the big notice abstractors can't get the notices in time. And we're having to work with those counties individually to get uh, notices on a timely basis uh, because of COVID. And so right now we have foreclosure data that nobody else in the market has. So we've, we've remained really committed to it and we're reinvesting in it now. But for quite a while there, it just didn't make sense to put a major investment into it. But I, I do see some light there and we are going to do that again. Yeah. I mean, we're definitely looking forward to seeing the nationwide coverage. So thank you for putting in the effort over the past yeah. two years. Awesome. Now, thank you so much for being on the show today. For the final question, I want to ask you if you have any advice for any young techies who want to get into prop tech space and what they should be doing to start their companies. So prop tech versus investing. Yep. Yeah. The number one thing I would say, like if I had to do it all over again, I would not build a company that was so reliant on data. Like it is just so hard, right? If I look at at billion dollar companies like Zendesk or Intercom or 
that were way in my wheelhouse, right? In terms of my past experience, my ability to create, you know, that aren't prop tech, you know, and that had much larger audiences than the rest. I probably have ideas right now of things I would build that would be good fits for venture capital and growth and, and the rest. So maybe not nixing prop tech altogether, but also, you know, keep in mind, you know, a data focused company like mine won't have the margins of a software company where the users put in the data rather than where you put in the data. So, you know, we, ha we spend millions of dollars on data, right? Another software company that doesn't have to go buy data doesn't have that expense and uh, their margins are going to be better. So I would, I would carefully think that through and really understand the difficulty and cost of, of data and focus on a vertical where users put in their own data. You know, I heard you say this at a conference one time and I thought about it for a while too, but don't you think that the difficult part kind of makes, you know, your company thrive? Like if, if it's easy to do, then a lot of other companies can come in and potentially take over your market share. But since it takes a lot of blood, sweat and tears to create something like Property Radar, it's not that simple that someone could come in and just take away whatever you built. Oh, uh, you know, certainly that's the hope. So, <laughs> you know, that's what I tell myself at this point for <laughs> continuing to do it. Yeah, you know, I, I think that there's lots of ways to get a unique advantage in a marketplace, right? And going out and doing something hard is certainly one of them. I would rather go out and do something hard though that I have control over, right? I don't necessarily have control over you know, whether or not Alameda County is going to, you know, let me get notices tomorrow or not. And that's going to change day to day. And I've got to have somebody calling them and working with them, you know, to try to get data. And there's 3,142 of those counties around the nation, right? And that's a different type of problem. It's not a tech problem, right? It's an operations problem. And being a technology guy, I, I got to tell you, I prefer the the technical problems and would probably rather, you know, again, 2020 hindsight, could I, if I could do it all over again, you know, on the other hand, I think what we're doing is super valuable. We've made this data more accessible, you know, to more people than I think any other, any other company at a more reasonable price than any other company ever has. And so I feel really good about that. Don't get me wrong. But if I knew it today, if I knew today, would I, you know, if I knew in 2007 what I knew today, I would not go down this path. <laughs> awesome. Well, Sean, thank you so much for being on the show today. How can people get in contact with you? Well, uh, I'm Sean at propertyradar.com. So that's really easy. Sean, same way you spell it, S-E-A-N. Our website's www.propertyradar.com. We've got a community uh, that I watch and, and answer questions in for real estate investing and non-software you know, software questions. Our support team is great or software related uh, questions. So lots of options there. Yeah, love to hear from anybody. Perfect. Well, Sean, thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure having you on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks, Sean. Thanks. 